Thank you for taking the time to listen to this message by Pastor Josh Kotz. We pray it blesses and encourages you throughout the week. If you'd like to know more about Living Word Church and the ministries associated with it, please visit our website at livingwordshawnee.org. Okay, I'm excited. I love the word. (laughs) It's like a treasure chest for me. It's better than any movie, any TV show. It's awesome. Love it. We're going to get into it today. So turn to Jeremiah chapter 29. All right, Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you that you are the word, God. Thank you for everything you've given us in the word. Praise you for it. So Jeremiah chapter 29, and we're going to be starting with verse 4 here in a second. <clears throat> but just to kind of give you guys a backstory of what we're going to be reading today, this is one of the many times that King Nebuchadnezzar had taken the Israelites captive. Um, he, he did this many times, but he took them captive, took them from their home in Jerusalem, and he took them captive and put them in Babylon. Okay? Everybody got it? That's the backstory of this whole chapter right here. So the Israelites are currently held in captivity in Babylon from their home, Jerusalem. Everybody say Jerusalem. All right. So Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 4, says, The Lord Almighty, sorry, I'm reading out of the NLT, I meant to mention that. It says, The Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, sends this message to all the captives he has exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. Build homes and plan to stay. Plant gardens and eat the food you produce. Marry and have children. Then find spouses for them and have many grandchildren. Multiply, do not dwindle away, and work for the peace and prosperity of Babylon. Pray to the Lord for that city where you are held captive, for if Babylon has peace, so will you. The Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says, Do not let the prophets and mediums who are there in Babylon trick you. Do not listen to their dreams, because they prophesy lies in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. The truth is that you will be in Babylon for 70 years. But then I will come and do for you all the good things I have promised, and I will bring you home again. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. We're going to stop there. So this this subject has been on my heart for a long time, and it's not originally what I was going to talk about. Um, Originally, I wanted to talk about God's timing, which that might be in here somewhere. But... As I was doing a little bit of research for God's timing, the Lord literally slapped me in the face with this whole chapter here, or this whole part of the chapter here. Um, And all of a sudden, I mean, I I was vocal about it by myself when I was reading. I was being vocal going, wow, wow. I was just blown away by the revelation that's just in these eight verses that we just read. Um, And I really really want you to get this today. I think it's going to be really encouraging for a lot of people, if not hopefully everybody, uh, it's very encouraging for me, and I don't see how it can't lift your spirit. So what I want to do is I want to go through these eight verses here, and I just want to break them down. I love breaking them down verse by verse, because I don't think there's one verse in the Bible that doesn't deserve to be broken down, that doesn't have revelation in it. I think every verse in the Bible is there for a reason. So there's something in every verse, and we're going to start with verse four here. Um, is that okay? I'm going to do a little more teaching today than just preaching. You guys want to be taught instead of preached at? Okay. So verse 4 says, The Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, sends this message to all the captives he has exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. All right. So we got Jeremiah. And what he's doing, Jeremiah's a prophet, and he's sending a letter 
to the Israelites that are being held captive in Babylon. All right? Now, the thing that I want us to take from this verse right here is that it was King Nebuchadnezzar who took the Israelites captive. But in this verse, it says that who exiled them? It says that the Lord exiled the Israelites to Babylon from Jerusalem. So we have King Nebuchadnezzar who took them captive, but it was the Lord who exiled them. Now what was going on here is the Israelites were being a little bit rebellious, and they were involved in a lot of idolatry. And so this was part of God's judgment on Israel to exile them to Babylon. Now he could have, he could have just exiled them. He could have just told them to go to Babylon, but instead he had King Nebuchadnezzar actually take them captive. This was part of it, okay? Now, the reason God exiled them for their rebelliousness and their idolatry is because he's a good God. I know that's weird. But a good dad doesn't let a crime go without discipline. All right? A good judge doesn't let a criminal come into the courtroom and then be like, I know you murdered all of those people, but you can just go home and just live, live normally. Okay? A good judge, when the criminal comes in, delivers justice. The right justice. A good judge del delivers consequences. Discipline. This is part of what makes God a good God, is that whenever there's something that deserves discipline, he delivers it. That's part of what makes him a good God. If he didn't, he wouldn't be a good God. A lot of people like to confuse that God is a good God with the fact that he never does anything like this to us. Or he never causes anything like this to happen in our lives. But if we didn't have God doing something like this in our lives, we would be worse off than we are and than we ever would be, right? It, things would be really bad. But because we have God, who is a good God and who is a good judge, who is there to be able to be like, you know, this isn't how we do it. I'm gonna, I, wanna, I wanna teach you something here, okay? There are consequences for your actions, right? There are consequences for your actions. And who's in charge of the consequences? The judge. Consequences don't just happen just because, right? The things that happen in our lives maybe because of something that, uh, a mistake that we made or maybe a lie that we told or something. The consequences of our actions are delivered by the only judge. There's nobody else is in charge of them. It's not just a random thing that happens. Everybody got me? Okay. So... This is what's going on. He exiled them to Babylon, but it was King Nebuchadnezzar who took them captive. So in a way, he used King Nebuchadnezzar to kind of deliver his judgment to Israel or the consequences for their action. All right, now, here's the deal. Jerusalem was their home, right? It was their home. Homes are comfortable. Homes are a good place to be, especially when it's clean. Bailey knows I can't even relax in the house if, if it's dirty. I just can't. I don't know why. <laughs> Samantha's back there. Yeah, me too. I, I really can't. So there have been times that I'll come home and, like, the floor is vacuumed, and I'm, she's like, I know you would want to be able to relax. So um, and don't think that she does all the housework either. We both do it, okay? I'm not saying I just come home and she's like, your table awaits, my Lord. It's not that kind of a thing. Okay, <laughs> we share the load, okay, because we're partners. So anyway, Jerusalem was, was Israel's home, and God exiled them to Babylon. How many of you think that they wanted to be in Babylon? You don't want to be exiled somewhere where it's not your home. That's not fun. So how many of you have ever been in a place that you don't want to be in? Probably all of us. It, could, it may not be like a geographical location or like a house or something. It may be even like a, a date. <laughs> Ever been at a date you don't want to be at? You know, don't, if, it's with, if it was with your wife, don't say anything. <laughs> I kind of singled out the men there. I'm sorry. If it was with your husband, don't say anything either. But it could be like, uh, never mind. I'm not. So, so we've all been, we've probably all been in a place that we don't want to be in. Before. Now, how many of you have ever been in a place you don't want to be in and God told you to go there? Okay, nobody raised their hand, but everybody's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Probably all of us. 
Every, every once in a while, God will say, I want you to go over there, and that's not where we want to go. I want you to go pray for that person, and you're going, I don't want to pray for that person. I want you to give 20 bucks to so-and-so. I don't want to give 20 bucks to so-and-so. So every once in a while, God will tell us to go somewhere or to do something we don't want to go to or do. Well, this is what's going on with the Israelites right now. God exiled them to a place that's not their home. It's not comfortable. It's not where they want to be. So we can relate to Israel, except I want you to know that even though in context of this passage right here, we're talking about the judgment that God delivered to Israel, I want you to know that every time God asks you to do something you don't want to do or tell you to go somewhere you don't want to go, it's not because he's judging you all the time. All right, it's, it, it may be, but I want you to know that if, if God tells you to go somewhere you don't want to go, sometimes it's just because he wants to use you in a particular situation, right? So right here, God exiles him to Babylon in verse, verse 5. This is how the prophetic word starts. Build homes and plan to stay. All right, off the bat, right off the bat, we know this is not going to be a flowery prophetic word. Because he's telling them to build homes and plan to stay in the place that is not their home. It's not where they want to be. He's telling them to stay there. Build something. Build something to live in and plan to stay. And then he says, plant some gardens and eat the food that they produce. So, when you plant a garden, it, it takes some time, right? You plant a garden, maybe you plant like, like especially something like an apple tree. It's going to take some time for that apple tree to grow, all right? It's going to take some time for these things to grow. So we're not, we're not talking about a short amount of time that they're going to be here. First of all, he said build some homes and plan to stay there. And then go ahead and plant some gardens too. And I want you to eat the food that they produce, which means you're going to have to wait on things to grow. Okay? Everybody follow me? They don't want to be here. I want to get that across today. They do not want to be in Babylon at all. This is not where they want to be. And God's like, go ahead and live there and eat from the gardens that you make. And then in verse 6, he says, marry and have children. And then he says, and then I want your children to have children. <laughs> That's a little bit. First, I've got to find somebody that I'm compatible with. And then we've got to have kids. And then we've got to raise these kids. And then they are going to have kids. This isn't a short amount of time. And this is not where they want to be. Verse 7. And work for the peace and prosperity of the city of Babylon. Pray to the Lord for that city where you are held captive. For if Babylon has peace, so will you. Now some translations say welfare instead of peace. Peace, prosperity, welfare. Now this is such a really incredible verse. Because after God tells them all this horrible stuff that they don't want to hear about how they're going to have to stay there a while and do all this stuff. He says, okay, now I want you to work for the prosperity of the city. And then I want you to pray to it or pray for the city because its prosperity is going to determine yours. He says, work for the prosperity and pray for the prosperity. Because its welfare, its peace, its prosperity is going to determine your prosperity. Now this is such a beautiful verse because it tells a story that God, hey, <laughs> there's like an echo. But this is such a beautiful verse because it tells a story that God's people have a power to transform the welfare of a city. It tells us that God's people have a power to transform the prosperity of a city because he says, Work for the prosperity of the city and pray for the prosperity of the city because its prosperity will determine yours. There's something so incredibly powerful about this. It shows the power that God's people can have 
if they're working in the name of God, if they're praying in the name of God for their city. Now, I want you to see something here. Normally, what happens, I feel like, in the body of Christ today, and, and I don't want anyone to feel condemned, but I want to point something out. I feel like we think that the only avenue for God to transform the prosperity or the welfare or even bring peace into a city, the only avenue is prayer. And what we do a lot is we tend to stay in our buildings and pray or stay in our houses and pray. And prayer is such an effective tool. Prayer can bring transformation. I mean, if you've been praying for somebody to, to even find Jesus for a long time, keep praying. If they haven't found Jesus yet, keep praying. It's an effective and powerful tool. But it's not the only tool that God tells Israel to use. He says, pray for the city for its welfare or its prosperity will determine your prosperity. But it also, he also says, work for the prosperity of the city. So there are two things when coupled together. Only when coupled together, I believe, there's a, there's a reason God said these things. That you can't just pray and you can't just work. You got to pray and you got to work. This doesn't mean like go out and like just get a job work like that. No, he says work for the prosperity of the city. Don't work for your prosperity only. Work for the prosperity of the city. Now this word work, I think in some translations it actually says seek. Does anybody have a translation that says seek the prosperity, peace and prosperity? So this word seek actually means to tread, which means to walk, Right? So there's a little bit of movement involved in finding the prosperity, in uncovering prosperity for our city. We can't just sit down and pray all the time and that be it. Eventually we got to get up and we got to walk and we have to do something. This is an action. It's a movement. Everybody follow me? So he says work and he says pray. Work and pray. Now how many of you know that it's really hard to pray for a place you don't want to be in. Sometimes it's, it's pretty tough. Yeah, just like it's hard, and we're just being honest here, just like it's hard to pray for somebody that offended you. In the same way. It's really hard to pray for a city or a place, a job. It's hard to pray for a job even that you don't want to be at. It's hard to work for the prosperity of a job or the people, your, your co-workers in your job. It's hard to work for those people or to pray for those people if you don't like the job, if you're not happy at it, right? Everybody agree? Yeah, it's, it's tough. We're human beings. It's okay to say it's tough because <laughs> it is. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's hard, it's hard to pray for people that don't like you. <laughs> Um, but I'm just being real, okay? We're human beings, and, and it's, it's hard to do this. Like some, We really need the grace of God in order to do it sometimes. Um, but God is telling these people, he's telling his people, I want you to work and pray for the city that you don't want to live in right now. That's tough. That's not a, that's not a fun word, right? That's not a fun word. Now, I don't want anybody in here to raise their hand and say, I don't want to be in this city today. I don't want that, okay? But I want you to know, and, and when, I, when I say city, let me say this first. When I say city, I don't just also mean like a literal geographical city. I could be talking about a season in your life. Sometimes you're in a season in your life you don't want to be in, and it's hard to pray. It's hard to work. You're like, all you're thinking about is, I want to get out of this season right now. You know, how many of you know the Israelites are probably thinking, I want to get out of this season right now. I don't want to be here. This is not my home. Okay? I don't have my TV here. I didn't bring any of my stuff with me. <laughs> Girls are like, I didn't do my makeup before we left. He just came in here and took us captive. I didn't have time to do my makeup. <laughs> so it's really tough to, to work and pray when you're in a season you don't want to be in. But this is part of the prophetic word God was given Israel. It's like, do it. Now, here's the other really awesome thing about this verse. I'm going to just stay on this verse for a second longer. There's so much in this verse. 
The other awesome thing about this verse right here is that the focus shifts from Israel to Babylon. God is no longer talking about what Israel can get or what they need to do or should do or anything, but the focus, he mentions it in here, but the focus has primarily shifted to Babylon. He's like, I want you to make Babylon prosper. Now, this is not where they wanted to be. This is not their home at all. They go into this place, they're taken captive. Who wants to make a city prosper that just took you captive and this is not where you want to be? This is tough. But God, I want you to know something. Another thing about what makes God good is that he cares about everything. He cares about everybody. And he wanted Babylon to prosper. And he's like, I'm going to go ahead and exile Israel here for their rebelliousness and their idolatry. And I'm going to go ahead and get some work done while I'm at it. And I'm going to bring prosperity to the Babylon through my people. Isn't that cool? See, God cares about this. Sometimes we're like, God doesn't care about my enemies. Well, God cares about your enemies. He loves your enemies. Or else he wouldn't tell us to love our enemies. It's God's kindness that leads men to repentance. I brought this up before. It's his goodness. It's his kindness that leads men to repentance. And if it's his kindness that leads men to repentance, they weren't in repentance to begin with. So he was kind to people who weren't in repentance. He was kind to people who weren't kind to him. Right? So yeah, of course, he wants to make Babylon prosper, even if Babylon was who took his people captive. It's just, God's awesome. He's amazing. So he's like, all right, these are your consequences for your actions. I'm going to go ahead and get some work done while I'm at it and make Babylon prosper. So he says, work for the peace and prosperity of the city and pray for it, for its prosperity will determine your prosperity. One more thing about this verse. He says, its prosperity will determine your prosperity. Now, what I want you to understand is that we don't live in some magical bubble all the time where it's like nothing bad ever happens to us because of what our city is doing or the decisions that our country is making. All right, I know, does that sound weird? Let me explain. So if there's a a pothole in the road out here, a pothole, (laughs) there is a pothole in the road out here. There's no if there. So there's a pothole in the road out here, okay? Just because God loves his people and protects his people and cares for his people doesn't mean that when you drive over that pothole, It's not going to make your car go like that. So there's some part in the natural, what's going on in our city, our environment, there's some part of it that affects us naturally. Because we we are spiritual beings, but we're still natural beings. And we don't want to get caught up in the thing that's like, I'm a totally spiritual being because I've been transformed and made new and everything, and that's great, but you're still in a human body. And human things are still going to happen, right? Right? It's like whenever we go outside, we don't, we're not in some magical bubble that just like deflects all of the environment away from us. And we're like just in la-la land all the time. It doesn't happen that way. There's still a part of the environment that affects us, right? If we live in a poor city, it's going to be hard to make money. Being real. If we live in a poor city, it's going to be hard to make money. If we live in an environment of poverty, it's hard to make money in an environment of poverty. It's, it's hard to find that provision. And, you know, my, my buddy and I, one of my buddies and I were talking one time, and uh, we were talking about how it just seems like the body of Christ is always struggling to get by. Like so many believers in the world, they just always just have barely enough. But, you know, we're believers. We're supposed to have more than enough, right? So, so we were talking about it. We're like, why is it? Why? I don't understand it. Why is it that believers have such a hard time getting by? Because you hear so many stories about, like, I've only got $5 in my bank account, and, you know, I'm just struggling to get to the next paycheck or whatever. But that's not how it's supposed to be. Because we're God's people, right? But I want you to know something. That God will always provide, no matter what. He will always provide. He will always make sure that you have enough to get by. But God doesn't want you to just have enough to get by. He wants us to have more than enough. And I want to propose something to you today, according to this verse right here. Sorry, my nose is really itchy. Is that bugging anybody? (laughs) 
But I want to propose something to you today according to this verse. That God will provide and he will always provide enough for his people to get by. But part of the more than enough comes from what we do to transform our environment. Right? Chill bumps. Because he says its prosperity will determine yours. Its welfare will determine yours. It's like, yeah, of course he's going to provide. He's not ever going to let them go without, I promise you. Because he's God, he's a good God, he's a father. He's never going to let them go without. But part of living in more than enough is using what God has given us to transform the welfare of our environment. That's part of it. And so I'm thinking about this conversation I was having with my friend where I'm like, why? I don't understand it. Well, now I get it. It's because a lot of the time we don't, if we're being honest, we don't do a whole lot to transform the welfare and the prosperity of our environment. I mean, I know that's convicting, but it's the truth. Especially nowadays, we get wrapped, more wrapped up in our cell phone than we do in our environment, right? And we're so, we're so focused on one thing, and one thing alone, when the environment around us is screaming for what is inside of us because of who we have, right? So I was, just, I was mentioning this to Bailey the other day. I'm like... I want to come up with creative ideas on how our business can bless our city. Like what if once a month we called up a random business in Shawnee and we took drink orders for everybody that was working at that time and we just brought them drinks. You know, like, like, like stuff like that. Like what can we do with what God has given us to help transform the prosperity of our city? If our city is in poverty, honestly, that's, that's on us. Because we have We have enough. We've got God, and we can, we can bring prosperity to our city through prayer, yeah, but also through work. Right? Man, that's okay. All right, there's a lot in verse 7. If you just want to go home and take, just take verse 7 home, I just want you to think about it. There's so much right there. All right, verse 8. And don't think we're going to forget about verse 7. Verse 8 says, The Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says, Do not let the prophets and mediums who are there in Babylon trick you. Do not listen to their dreams because they prophesy lies in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. Now, he's talking about false prophets and fortune tellers here. Now, most of the time when we think of false prophets, we think of like prophets who are like spewing really dirty stuff. Really dirty stuff. Like, this shouldn't be said. But what he's talking about, the false prophets here, what makes a false prophet is someone who prophesies in the name of God and it's not God actually speaking. That's all it makes a false prophet. So it can be something really good sounding. And what was going on here is the false prophets that were prophesying here were actually saying things like, don't worry, God's going to get us out of here soon. God's going to get us out of here in no time. It won't be long and we'll be out of here. This is the th- these are the things that the false prophets were prophesying. That's why he called them fortune tellers in another translation. Because they're telling fortune. It's good stuff. It's great stuff to, to be able to hear. But it's not what God was saying. And God didn't want the people to listen to this fortune telling. Because it's not the truth. It may sound really nice and really good. But it's not the truth. The truth is. The truth is. Verse 10. You'll be in Babylon for 70 years. That's the truth. So he's like, don't listen to these false prophets because even though it all sounds good and great and everything, I don't want you to listen to them because it's not what I'm saying. I'm telling you right now, build homes and plan to stay, plant some gardens, have kids and let them have kids. You're going to be there for 70 years. Now, why on earth would God not want them to listen to this good fortune? Why would he not want them to listen to something good? You know, sometimes we have people come up and prophesy over us. And if you've ever done this, I don't want you to feel condemned today. I just want to point something out. That it, sometimes, you know, I've had people come up and prophesy things to me. It's like, the season in your life is about to end. And I'm going, no, it's not. This season, God wanted, wants me in this season for a long time. And, they're, they're, and I'm like, you know, of course, I would, it would, I would feel really good to believe that. You know, this season's about to end. But what happens whenever I believe 
that I'm in a season that God wants me to be in, whatever, what happens whenever I believe that he wants me out of it immediately or soon is I stop doing things. So he's like, don't listen to these false prophets who are saying good fortune and it's, it's going to be okay and everything's going to be fine and dandy because it's not. You're going to be here for 70 years. Don't listen to them because if you do, you're not going to get any work done. It's like putting in your two weeks notice and then only showing up for a few days. You know it's going to be over soon, so you might as well just quit now. See, that's why he's saying don't, don't listen to them because it's not going to be over soon. <laughs> and I want you to get some work done. We've all been in that position before. I want you to, 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 to hear this today. If anybody ever comes up to you and delivers a prophetic word of any kind, don't just say, you know, I believe you or yes, because you're pastor so-and-so. Whatever their title is, it doesn't matter. Everybody's held accountable the same to, to God's word. If somebody's prophesying something over you, you take that prophetic word home and you'd be like, God, is this true? Is this what you want for me? Is some, I mean, this is what the word tells us to do. Judge every word. Weigh every word. This is what it's talking about. Take it home. Take it with you. Bring it before God. He says, bring it before me. And I'll, I'll tell you exactly what I'm saying. If there's anything in there that I'm not saying, I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he's like, don't listen to these guys. They're not telling you the truth. I love them, but don't listen to them. All right? If God ever tells you not to listen to somebody, don't... Don't go up them, to them and say, God told me not to listen to you. <laughs> just, just don't, okay? Just don't listen to them. <laughs> Everybody with me on that? Okay. <sighs> All right. So then after he says the truth is that you're going to be in Babylon for 70 years, he says, but then I will come and do for you all the good things I have promised and I will bring you home again. And then in verse 11, he says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Now, one more thing I want to say about these false prophets. Sometimes we confuse our desires with God's desires. And I think part of the reason these, these prophets were prophesying falsely is because the desire in their heart was that they would be delivered from Babylon soon. And sometimes we think that because we have a desire like that, that God must want that too. And so they begin prophesying these things out of the desire in their heart, but not what God is actually saying. So it's, it's very important that in those times, we remember that not every time is our desire going to be God's. And we want to pray that our desires become his, but sometimes they just aren't going to be. And we got to be ready to give up those things and realize this, is, this really isn't what God wants. You know, I thought before being in, stuck in a season or something and just being like, there's no way God could want this for me right now because this is absolutely terrible. <laughs> Why would God want me to be stuck in a season this bad? Well, I don't know, but God knows. Verse 11, for I know the plans I have for you. Going to be stuck in that season, going to be stuck at that job. I know it sounds really bad, but I, just, I want it to bring encouragement to you today. Be stuck in that season, be stuck in that job, be stuck in that city, be stuck in whatever it is, and be like, there's no way God could want this for me because this is probably hell on earth. This is the closest that I can get. Has anybody ever been there before? But when you look back on it, after you've come out of that season, and you look back on it, you realize that's why God wanted me in that season. There's something that he did there. You're like, I see what he did there now. You know, in the midst of that season, I couldn't see what he was doing, but now I can see it. And this is part of what he was doing with Israel here. He exiled them. Sure, it was consequences. But in the middle of all of that, he used them to bring prosperity to a city. This verse 11 here, whenever he says, for I know the plans I have for you, actually in some translations it says, I know the thoughts that I think toward you. 
Does anybody else have that translation? Now, when he says, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, I think it's him reassuring Israel, listen, I'm aware of how I feel about you. I'm aware of it. And everything that I'm doing right now, I'm doing on purpose. I haven't let it slip by. I still love you. And I still have plans for you. I haven't forgotten how I feel about you. And sometimes in those seasons, wherever, it's, wherever we're at, sometimes we can feel like God's forgotten about me. He really has, but he doesn't. It's, part, it's, it's his plan. Uh, Proverbs 16, Proverbs 16, 9. Um, Man plans his course, but the Lord establishes his steps. Right? So, you know, in Proverbs 16, 9, it says man plans his course. It's like, I, th- I think God still wants you to make plans, but ultimately it's going to be God who establishes your steps. If you are God's people, and you are God's people by receiving Jesus, becoming a part of his body, if you are God's people, then you're always going to be right where he wants you to be. I know that's really weird to say. It might sound like a little bit like bad theology, but I want you to hear me. If you are God's people, he establishes your steps, and you're always going to be right where he wants you to be. The only time you would not be where God wants you to be is if you stepped out of a relationship with Jesus Christ and decided to live on your own. But while you are a part, of, a part of his body, you are attached to the head, which is Jesus Christ, and he alone decides where you will go and where you're gonna be at, okay? Is it, you're God's people. That's how it goes. And you might be in a season right now that you're like, there's no way God could want me to be here, but I promise you he's doing something. He's doing something at your job. He's doing something in your church. He's doing something for you in your city. He's doing something in your family. If there's a season in your family right now, something that's going on, God is doing something. He's moving. And this verse 11 here, whenever he says, I know the plans I have for you, I I realize I've taken this verse out of context for a long time. Because this verse tends to be used more in a flowery sense of like, everything's going to be okay all the time. But in the context of this passage, he's saying, I know it's not okay, but I want you to be here. This is where I want you. I know it's not okay right now, but this is where I want you. I'm doing something. I have a plan. And God's plan for us is not that we would escape our season, but that we'd learn how to prosper in the midst of it. And sometimes when we're in our season, we're in that dark tunnel, and we see the light at the end of the tunnel, we know that God has said there's gonna be a day, eventually. I mean, for all of us in here, if if you've received Jesus Christ, for everyone in here, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, it's called heaven. There's always gonna be a light at the end of the tunnel. But heaven Getting to heaven is not our focus. That's what drives us to keep going. But ultimately, our focus needs to be on what's around us because God wants us to change our environment while we're here. And if our focus is just completely centered on I'm getting to heaven someday, we're not gonna get anything done, right? So it's a finish line that drives us. If we're always looking at what's ahead of us, then we're never going to see what's around us. It's a finish line that drives us, but the finish line is not our focus. So this verse 11 here, it's, it's so important that we get this. It's so important that we understand this, that, that sometimes you're going through hardship because it's part of God's plan. And I'm not saying that God makes bad things happen to you. That's not what I want to say, that he's just causing bad things to happen to us all the time. But if there is any sort of season or a place that we don't want to be, and you know that God put you there, like let that be something that you hold on to to keep going. That God put me here. And sometimes, you know, when we're in this, this season of our life, you know, that's tough, we're like looking for that open door to be able to go somewhere else. Well, tell me, this is what happens, though. Most of the time, we're like waiting for that open door is we just kind of take a seat. 
And we sit there and just stare at the door and wait on it to open. But God's like, I don't want you to sit down. You know, I love you, and I love doing great things for you, but it's not just about you. It's about everyone around you, everything around you. I have put you here for a reason. I've put you here because I want you to experience a great life, but there is something that you have that your environment needs. And if you just sit there and wait on me to open a door for you, you can't open a door for other people. Right? And that's what we're here for. We're here to make sure that people see Jesus. We're here to make sure that we open those doors so that God can come in. It's not just about us getting through those doors, it's about us opening those doors. He's given us the keys to the kingdom, right? Because we sit in, in heavenly places right next to Jesus Christ. Is everybody with me? So how many of you are in a season right now that you don't wanna be in? Let's just be honest. Yeah. Right, and if you didn't raise your hand, that's okay. Because I know it happens a lot. If you're in a season right now you don't want to be in, you're at a job you don't want to be at, you're like waiting for God to open up another opportunity for you so you can have somewhere else to go or something like that, I want you to know right now, you're God's kid. He's got you in the palm of his hand, and he is doing something. And I want you to open your eyes. I want you to see what he is doing, and I want you to see what he wants to do with you where you're at. Don't forget that you are a tool also. You're a child, you're, you're his prize, but you're also something that God wants to use to bring transformation to your city and prosperity to your city. And I wanna see Shawnee prosper. I don't know about you guys. I wanna see Shawnee prosper. I wanna see Tecumseh prosper. I wanna see Seminole prosper. I wanna see Oklahoma City prosper. I wanna see it happen. And I believe that this group of people right here and the body of Christ are the keys to the prosperity and welfare of the city. Work and prayer. Work and prayer. So let's not just pray. Let's do something. Let's tread. Let's walk. Let's uncover the grace and the favor of God in every place that we're at. Let's make it happen. Do something. And if you, if you, you may be sitting there thinking right now, I don't have anything to give to my city. That's not true. That is not true. The reason God wants to use his people is because he's got everything. He is the richest being in the universe. He has everything you will ever need and more. He's got so much and you are his child and all of that is yours. So you never don't have enough. You always have enough. And we can always give that. We can always do things. So let's stand. All right, so all I want to do today is I just want us to pray together. You can just stay right where you're at. I just want us to pray together. The first thing I want us to do, though, that I love to do this, is I just want to take us, us to take a minute and to examine our situation. All right, and it may look really bad, but I want us to examine our situation. And what I mean by situation is whatever it is that's on your heart right now or in your mind that's like, this is not what I want right now, but if you believe God's put you there, like, that's where you belong. So let's examine our situation. Let's just close our eyes so we, we don't think about anything else and just examine that situation. And I want us to find God in there somewhere. And I can't, I can't do this for you. Nobody can do this for you, but find God in there somewhere. What is he doing? Find something that he has done. And once you find that thing that he has done, I want you to cling to it.
Now let's just pray this together. Father, we align our desires with yours. We align our thoughts with yours. Show us what you're doing and show us what you want us to do. Show us who you are and show us who you want us to be. Give us hope. Give us strength. Give us courage. Give us faith to keep going, to press on, to run the way, race to the finish line. Let us focus not on our goal, but your goal. Let us focus not on our end, but on your end. Let us see through your eyes. Let us work through your hands. Let us walk through your feet. Let us be like you. Now let's just lift our hands. And whatever that is that you, you examine that situation, whatever it is that you've clung to, I just want you to praise God for it. You use your mouth. Just praise God for whatever that is. If you found God in your situation, hopefully you did, just begin to move your lips a little bit and just thank God for it. God, thank you that you are moving. Thank you that you are working. Thank you, God, that you have not forgotten about us. You have not forgotten about us, God. You still desire us. You still desire the best for us. You still love us. No matter what is going on, no matter what you are bringing us through, God, you have not forgotten us, and we trust you. We put our hope in you. We put our faith in you. We thank you, God, that your thoughts are still about us. Your plans are still for us. You're at work. You're always working. You never sleep. You never get tired. Thank you, God, that you are for us and not against us. And we praise you for it, Jesus. We praise you for it. Come on, let's just give him some thanks. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for fighting our battles. God, thank you, God, for sticking it out with us, God, whenever we feel like giving up. God, thank you for being strong whenever we feel weak. Thank you for having hope whenever we feel hopeless, God. Thank you for being a symbol of faith whenever we don't have any, God. Thank you for pressing on. Thank you for pulling us forward. Thank you for being our father. Thank you for being our warrior, our prince, our king. We worship you and we thank you and we bless you for today. God, I just ask for your favor to be on every person in this room, Lord, and that it would be realized favor, not just favor, not, not invisible favor, but realized favor, God, that it would be seen and it would be felt and it would be experienced, God, in every aspect of our lives and these situations, these seasons, God, these cities that we're in where we don't wanna be, Lord. We believe and we stand by your word. We stand by your plan for us, God. And we just want you to use us in whatever way you can. We wanna be used to bring prosperity to our city, God. We wanna be used to bring revival to our city, Jesus. In whatever way that we can, God, forgive us for focusing so much on ourselves and not on what you wanna do with us, God, and what you wanna do through us and what you wanna do for our city, God. Forgive us for making it so much about us that in those situations where you tell us to do something or to go somewhere that we don't want to, God, forgive us for making it so much about us that we don't. But God, give us the courage to step out now, even when we don't feel like it or don't have a desire to. Give us the courage to step out just because we want to be obedient to your word and your plan for our lives, God. And the plan, God, we believe you have plans for Shawnee. And we want to be a part of making those plans real, making them come to life. God, you are the architect, but we want to be the builders. So make us builders, God. Make us builders. And like the, that passage said, God, let us not dwindle away. Let us not shrink back and hide in our buildings, in our houses, in our closets, God. But let us be exposed to the world. God, the world needs to see your light. And if we are hiding it under a lamp, God, 
under a lampshade or under a bowl, God, then we cannot let them see your light, God. The, the world needs to see your light. Shawnee needs to see your light. We need more than just a bunch of fast food restaurants, God. We need our city to prosper. We need welfare for our city, Jesus. We need the police force to prosper. We need the jobs, the, every employee in this city, God, to prosper. No more struggling, God. No more poverty, God. We just ask that you would make this city rich with favor. You would make it rich with blessings, God. We open up heaven right now in the name of Jesus. And we just ask that you begin to pour out your blessings on this city. We open up heaven with our praises. We open up heaven with our praises today, God. We open up heaven with our praises and our thanks. We open up the gates with our thanks, God. And we just ask that your presence and the favor and the blessing of your, of your spirit would begin to pour out onto our city, God. And whatever city that we live in, Lord, just begin to make these cities prosper. Begin to make our environments rich, God, and thick with the presence of God. Lord, we ask that, people, that miracles will begin happening in bank accounts, God. And miracles will begin happening in cars, God, and in houses and in families, God, because of the rich favor of God that's, been, that's going to rest on this city and bring revival to it. And we thank you, God, for what you're doing in this body specifically, God, but we just ask that it would be exposed. Thank you, Lord. We agree and we believe it. We agree and we believe it. And we say, so be it. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's give, let's give blessing to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this message by Pastor Josh Cotts. We pray it blesses and encourages you throughout the week. If you'd like to know more about Living Word Church and the ministries associated with it, please visit our website at livingwordshawnee.org.